Hey everyone, I want to show you a fake Pokemon that I drew the other day. Check it out. He's a cute but grumpy sea urchin that just needs a little bit more love. Honestly, I'm pretty close to believing that. Before I got back into Pokemon with X and Y, I probably would have believed that this thing was made up if someone showed it to me. This little sea urchin thingy is so forgotten. When playing through Johto as a kid, I honestly don't remember seeing this thing once. There's a trainer on the route before Victory Road that has two of them on his team, but that's the only fight in the game that I've encountered recently where it shows up. While I was preparing for this challenge, I began to start to like this thing. It has this cute pink mouth, grumpy yet lovable eyes, and an extremely strange tail. What's not to love? Today, I'm going to be beating Pokemon Gold with it. In the stats department, Quillfish isn't that bad. It actually has a higher base stat total than Dunsparce. It gets better attack, defense, and speed. It only loses out slightly with 10 less special attack and special defense. With how tanky Dunsparce was, I'm curious to see how Quillfish can do in the early game. Its level up learn set is another story. It doesn't have an awesome move like Rage to start off with. I can't believe that I called Rage awesome. However, we do get access to Stab Poison Sting immediately. Funny enough, in Pokemon Crystal, they actually gave this guy Spikes as a starting move. I wonder what that discussion was like. Hey Masuda, I don't think Quillfish is getting enough love. What if we added Spikes to its opening learn set? That way people would use it way more. Like seriously, none of the AI trainers ever switch their Pokemon out. Spikes is essentially useless in a playthrough. So for today, I'm going to be playing Pokemon Gold. I don't need the spikes. From TMs and HMs, Quillfish gets access to Headbutt, Curse, Rollout, Blizzard, Return, Sludge Bomb, Defense Curl, Rest, and Surf. Honestly, that's a really great move pool. Sludge Bomb and Surf will be great choices for Stab. Luckily, Generation 2 is the first time a move deleter was implemented, so teaching Quillfish Surf early on won't affect its ability to have an adaptable move set later on. However, I suspect that Surf will stick around for the majority of the run anyways. Let's talk about the rollout and defense curl combo. When I finished my Dunsparce run with return and rest, I immediately got curious about how this little land snake's abilities with rollout and defense curl would pan out. Turns out these moves make the league and the fight against red significantly easier. Here's how it works. Each time rollout hits, its power is doubled. So 30, 60, 120, 240, and then 480 if you're lucky enough to land 5 hits. The crazy thing is, is that it's also doubled if you have previously used Defense Curl. I guess the logic here is that the harder you get, the more you're able to put out. Uh, I'll allow Rollout, but because of how strong this combo is, I'm going to play through the game trying Quillfish's other options. I may add Defense Curl into the mix for Red if it truly feels hopeless. These are the rules for this challenge. I'll only use Quillfish in battle. I won't use any items in battle, including held items. Finally, I won't use any glitches or exploits. I will be, of course, catching some other Pokemon in order to progress through the game and use HMs. So now, with that out of the way, let's get into it. I used the Universal Pokemon Randomizer to modify the ROM file and replace one of the starters with the challenge Pokemon. So if you're curious how I did this, that's how. I've left a link to the program in the description below. Today I'm going to replace Cyndaquil with Quillfish. The Generation 2 starter Pokemon are the only set that are all monotypes before Generation 8. Starters like Trico, Torchic, and Mudkip are also monotypes at the start but their final evolutions are dual types. Some other examples are Oshawott and Snivy, who are both monotypes throughout their entire evolutionary lines. Here though, Tapig evolves into a dual type, on the unfortunate firefighting combination. In this specific instance, we would think that Quillfish should go up against a grass starter, but Chikorita is quite frankly pretty weak. It's also mono grass, so it's going to get steamrolled by Quillfish's stab poison moves, especially Sludge Bomb later on. Because Fire is weak to water, I think Totodile is going to be the hardest starter to face. Also, I make sure that I get a male Quillfish. In Generation 2, a Pokemon's gender is determined exclusively by its attack DV. So if I get a low attack stat, 
then I have a female quillfish. Originally, I played through a bit with a female quillfish, but eventually I decided to restart the challenge and at least get a quillfish with decent attack. The things that I do to raise the quality of the content. The first fight against Totodile clearly demonstrates this. I'd have 45 power poison sting against Chikorita with a chance to poison, but here against Totodile, things are fairly even. This fight ends up being significantly closer than it was with Dunsparce. With the rival out of the way, I head back to give him a name. Since he told us his name was three question marks, I gave him four question marks just to be slightly sassy. From now on you will be known as… well actually, we're not really sure what to call you. It feels so good to set out on a Pokemon adventure. I get to battle rivals with my cute little sea urchin. Puff is doing such a good job. Look at him defeat the fearsome rats. I think one of the things about these adventures that I really love is that it feels so freeing. You can just explore without NPCs constantly nagging you. Oh, look, it's my phone. Mom, I I'm going on a Pokemon adventure. I don't need you calling me all the time. All right, fine, you can save my money. I really just button mashed right through that one. I've got to go beat Faulkner with my sea urchin. Wait, what? You, you say it's a, it's a puffer fish? No, no, mom, it's really not. Look, it has a bunch of spikes. Sea urchins have spikes. Okay, I'll talk to you later. I really hope uh, she doesn't buy anything dumb with my money. Outside of Violet City, I spend some time and catch a bell sprout. In my Dunsparce video, I got a Paris in the forest, but it only has a 5% chance to spawn during the day. I really thought it was higher, so I don't want to waste time there today. Bellsprout has a 20% chance here, so this is a much better option. Funny enough, it took me a while to find one. With that out of the way, I can proceed. Sprout Tower is easy to complete. There are actually wild Pokemon in here, but their encounter rate is so low. I wish that caves had this sort of encounter rate, especially when there are only Zubat and Geodude to be found. I finish off the Sage, and then make my way over to the Flying Gym. Faulkner opens with Pidgey, a level 7 Pidgey, in a gym battle. I think he has one of the most underwhelming teams of any gym leader in any Pokemon game. Unfortunately though, it knows Mud Slap. This is basically a superpowered sand attack. It lowers my accuracy twice before Quillfish knocks it out. His poor little grumpy eyes are all filled with mud now. Pidgey's such a meanie. Faulkner sends out his ace, a level 9 Pidgeotto. Unfortunately for me, I don't do much damage, and the mud slaps are starting to make me miss. Because of that, I switch into Poison Sing, in the hopes that when I do hit, I'll get poison. At least then he'll be taking damage when I miss. Unfortunately, I miss too much, and he knocks me out. This defeat feels similar to losing to Bruno in Generation 1. It's a feeling of deep, and profound embarrassment and shame. Did this really just happen? Is my little sea urchin this weak? On the second fight, things start off worse. Pidgey lands not two, but four mud slaps that each lower my accuracy. In this generation, mud slap has a 99.6% chance to lower the opponent's accuracy. I guess it's nice that this is the only generation where there's actually a 0.4% chance of hope. In every other generation, it always lowers the target's accuracy. After knocking the Pidgey out, I switch into Poison Sting, and this time, I land my first hit and it poisons. Because Pidgeotto isn't doing much damage, I take the victory. If Pidgey didn't have Mud Slap, Quillfish would have got through that without having to reset. It's okay, Puff. The mean birds are gone now. I grab the Togepi Egg because I think I'll need it for Flash in Mount Silver. However, Bellsprout can learn Flash, so there's another reason to pick it up early on. Actually, I was just playing my Stantler run, and you actually can't proceed past this point without getting the egg, so I did have to get it no matter what. After that, I stock up on supplies and head out from Violet City. I bought these potions to prevent trips back to the Pokemon Center after fighting the Hiker in Union Cave. I doubt that I'll be level 19 by the cave, which is when Quillfish learns Water Gun so fighting these rock types might be slightly tedious. There's only one mandatory hiker in Union Cave. Rock and ground types both resist poison moves, and rock types resist normal moves, so this one is going to take Quillfish a while to get through. Luckily his Pokemon are at absurdly low levels. 
It's a bit of a chore, but I make it through without issue. On the lower level of Union Cave is the TM for Swift. I'm going to teach this to Quillfish to replace Tackle. It's going to speed up the next portion of the game to have a slightly higher base power normal move. I get to try it out on the Vulpix Trainer at the door to the cave. Yup, that does feel a lot better. Outside the cave, I have to dodge Hiker Anthony. I really don't want to face another rock Pokemon just yet. I finish up Slowpoke well and save all these poor pink Pokemon from the evil Team Rocket. Quillfish feels a deep connection with them, because he also has a cute little pink mouth. After that, I spend a bit of time leveling up. This is so that when I defeat Bugsy, I'll level up to level 19 and learn Water Gun. I'm going to need it to defeat the rivals Ghastly. Bugsy's Metapod and Kakuna aren't an issue. Swift can two hit them. They give me some experience, and I'm fairly confident that Scyther will get me all the way to 19. It comes out and does a small amount of damage with Quick Attack. Then it switches into Fury Cutter, which I resist, and that makes it an easy victory for the mighty Quillfish. It levels up and learns Water Gun. He's uh, trying to impress me now after the embarrassment that was the first gym. With Water Gun on my set, I now have an easy way to knock out the rivals Ghastly. It takes only two hits. Zubat is second, and it annoys me a little bit with confusion, but it wears off just before I take it down. Against Crocknaw, I switch into Swift and knock it out in three turns. When I used to play through Generation 2 as a kid, this fight used to cause me some serious issues. I always forgot that it occurred here, and wouldn't be completely fully healed when he would show up. That was such a core element of these early generation rivals. They seemed to show up at the worst possible time. All your Pokemon would be damaged, and they'd challenge you to a fight that you really didn't want. Now that I prepare for this fight, it's rarely a big issue. It's time for a new segment of the video. Here are a few interesting things that the comments taught me after playing my previous Dunsparce challenge. Number 1. I told a story about battling my rival before finding Slowpoke's well. Well, this is impossible. He actually only shows up after you've defeated the Rockets. Number 2. When catching Paris in my Dunsparce run, I paralyzed it with Glare in order to increase my catch rate. But in Generation 2, there's a glitch that causes only Sleep and Freeze to increase the catch rate. So really, I just paralyzed it because apparently I'm cruel. 3. The Headbutt TM that you get in the forest is not the only one that you get. You can just actually buy another one in the department store. I can't believe that I never realized that. I used to plan so carefully which Pokemon I taught it to. 4. In my fight against Chuck, his Polyrath missed with Hypnosis after using Mind Reader. This is because all Pokemon the AI uses in Generation 1 and 2 have a 25% chance to miss all status moves, regardless of their accuracy. This 25% debuff is not overridden when a move like Mind Reader is used, so there's still a chance that the move will miss. 5. I got confused as to why Blastoise used Blizzard in the fight against Red. This is because Sunny Day was on the field. It cuts the power of water moves by half, and I totally forgot that that was one of its effects. Can you uh, tell that I've never played competitive Pokemon? A big part of my journey here on YouTube so far has been learning so much from all of you in the comments, so thanks for sharing this information. I think my challenges are beginning to become far more consistent and well thought out in recent days. However, I do know that there's still a lot to be improved. I do need to watch out for accidentally using an awful move due to A button spam, or perhaps mistyping Venom off. I used to think that it was psychic flying, but recently I've come to the awareness that it is definitely a grass flying type. It's got wings, look at this Pokemon card. Uh, you can't argue with that. With the forest behind us, it's Whitney time. She opens with Clefairy. Because Miltank is very strong, and Rollout doesn't have a 100% accuracy, I choose to go for a couple minimizes first. With everything that Whitney has done to the Pokemon community, I am not above using some cheesy strats against her. After knocking the Clefairy out, I poison Miltank first turn. That is the perfect first turn. Second turn, I do a bit of damage and it misses again. Then, it lands Stomp, and poor little Quillfish gets completely wrecked. So. I did this fight two more times, and each time the result was the same. 
I even tried to set up more minimizes, but whenever Miltank lands a hit, it does massive damage. I'm sort of kicking myself for deleting Harden now. That would have been really good to set up before taking the Miltank on. For now, I've got to go train and get a few more levels under Quillfish's belt. On the way, I steal Kenya. Supposedly if you take it back to its trainer, the guy just gives it to you anyways. Well, this poor little bird never needs to know that its original trainer doesn't want it. I'm never taking it back. You're mine now. After training a bit, I grab the TM for rollout. Remember when I said I wasn't above using some cheesy strats for Whitney? Yeah, let's use her own cheese against her. There's uh, there's gotta be some like cheese and mill tank joke in here somewhere, but like I just can't find it. So if you find it, put it in the comments below. Remember, I'm allowing rollout for this run, but I'll avoid using defense curl unless things get very hopeless. With rollout on my side, I set up minimize again. I need to have a few turns of power up in order to deal good damage to Miltank. I land two hits with rollout and take the Clefairy down. Miltank comes out, and I do massive damage to it. Not enough to knock it out immediately, but enough that I'm certain I've taken the victory. Whitney is no more. I grab the squirt bottle next. This has got to be the easiest item to forget or miss. And then after that I grab the bike. This one's also easy to forget when you play on 3 times speed. Biking around just makes everything, like getting through doors and small winding passages, nearly impossible. I will need it for Kanto though, so it's best to just pick it up now. I also grab the radio card, and this is going to be important for Kanto too. I clear the pseudo Wudo, and then I run into an issue. Yeah, this psychic with a drowsy really messes Quillfish up. I have to come back here and save in front of him. The second fight, I just immediately knock the drowsy out. So I guess it was a range? Perhaps if I was slightly lower level, I would have got stuck here for a little while. In Ecratique City, I decide to switch up my routing. I usually black out when I face the rival or Morty right away. I'll do the Kimono Girls first and get some extra experience and unlock Surf before these tough fights. Since there is a move deleter in this generation, I can just learn this now and remove it later if it isn't helping. Unfortunately, even with Surf and some extra experience on my side, I'm not where I need to be to defeat the rival. In the first fight, Quillfish does a great job getting to Zubat, and then some seriously terrible confusion luck results in a loss. I got a bit stubborn here. I come back for a fifth attempt, and again I sweep through his opening two Pokemon and arrive at the pesky Zubat. I will not accept the fact that Zubat is stalling me out here. I land a rollout and then get confused. Quillfish hits itself in confusion, and then the following turn, rollout misses. Lucky for me, I land at the following turn and I'm finally moving on to the Crocknaw without confusion. It doesn't deal very much to us with Bite, and rollout knocks it out in two turns. This fight was uh, surprisingly hard. Usually it's Haunter's Curse but this time Zubat was the issue. And I'm sure some of you now are screaming in the comments, please just use Surf against Zubat. Yeah, I know. I really wanted to seem cool with Rollout, and I wasn't really thinking about Surf. I also played this fight around four weeks ago, and I've honestly learned a lot in that amount of time. Morty opens with Ghastly. I'm getting to be overleveled, and this is now present day me playing. I remember my Surf modifier and spam it throughout this entire Fife. Fife? What the heck? What was that? I remember my Surf modifier and spam it throughout this entire fight. His first three Pokemon all go down in a single hit. Even the Gengar does due to a critical hit. However, the final Haunter survives. It uses Spite, which doesn't save it, and Quillfish has earned his fourth badge. Well done, little guy. I head out west of Ecratique City, and after a battle with fellow Poketuber Birdkeeper Toby, I get a call from my mom. Oh no, please say it isn't a Snorlax doll. Oh, okay, a useful item. That sounds nice. Thanks, mom. The next phase of the game, I complete the first portion of the lighthouse, and then make my way across the sea to battle Chuck. At this point, you'll notice that the footage has smoothed out slightly. It's because I changed the emulator that I was using when I came back to complete this footage. I've been aware of these stuttering issues since I first started making challenge videos, and I'm so happy that I've been able to eliminate the vast majority of the problems now. 
In Chuck's gym, I forgot that I need a Pokemon to teach strength to, so I quickly catch a Krabby. Chuck opens with Primate. Because it doesn't have amazing special defense, I can knock it out in two hits with Surf. It does manage to land a Leer before going down, and that will improve the damage from Polyrath's not very effective Dynamic Punch. I accidentally, due to A button spam, use a first turn Surf against Polyrath. This mistake feels really bad, since this fight can really get frustrating with sleep and confusion. Polyrath uses Mind Reader, and now we can remember that this won't ensure that Hypnosis lands, because of the 25% chance for AI to fail status moves. But in this case, it does ensure that Dynamic Punch lands the next turn. Quillfish resists it and tanks the damage like a serious boss. It does confuse my little sea urchin though, so I deal a bit of damage to myself in confusion, and then Polyrath misses another Dynamic Punch. After that, I land my next two hits and take it out. Overall, an easy fight. I fly back and get Amphi the medicine that it needs. By the way, I forgot in my Mew video that one of my girlfriend's favorite Pokemon is Mareep. She calls it Fleecy, by the way, because it's a sheep and sheep have wool fleeces, I guess. Jasmine is next. Because I'm a water type, I think that this is going to be manageable. Water is one of the few types that Steel doesn't resist, and that will allow Quillfish to get good damage in against Magnemite, as well as super effective damage against Steelix. In addition, water resists Steel, and her Steelix doesn't know any ground moves. Quillfish is a serious tank in this fight. That was my easiest Jasmine fight yet. On the way to the Lake of Rage, I get a call from my mom again. Oh no, she, she bought me a doll. Mom, why did you spend my money on useless stuff? I wanted a useful item. Why did I have to spam A so much and let her save my money? The lesson I must take away from producing this video is, don't spam A, especially when mom calls. I catch the Gyarados so I have a Pokemon to use Waterfall, and then I start the Rocket plot line. This next section of the game is going to unlock the incredible TM Sludge Bomb. In order to obtain it, I'll need to complete the Rocket Hideout. In Generations 1, 2, and 3, the move's type determines if it's a physical move or a special move. In this case, Poison is a physical type, meaning that Sludge Bomb will get access to Stab and utilize our high attack stat. If you come from modern Pokemon games, this will feel really strange because Sludge Bomb is a special move in those games. An unfortunate fact about this generation is that Poison is only super effective against Grass Pokemon. Fairy types didn't exist yet, except for Venomoth, which is uh, Fairy Psychic. Most of the Grass types are dual types with Poison anyways, so we're not going to be landing very many super effective hits with Sludge Bomb. Poison is honestly a pretty trash offensive typing. A lot of Poison Pokemon are designed with stall tactics in mind. Just look at Muk, Crobat, and Ariados from Koga's team. Sort of strange that he has a Venomoth too. Huh. Before I grab Sludge Bomb, I take on Price. He's never a challenge. Rollout isn't super effective against Seal because it's a mono water type, but I can get set up here so that Dugong will take a lot of damage. Unfortunately, when it comes out, Quillfish misses, so I've got to start all over again. I'm rolling by the time Pillow Swine comes out, but it has the ground typing, so it's only going to take neutral damage from Rollout. It isn't a threat though, because it just loves to spam Fury Attack, so a couple turns later I've earned myself the badge. After that, I grab Sludge Bomb, and then I take care of the Rockets and Goldenrod. I had a realization playing through this after doing so many Kanto runs recently. There aren't nearly as many random trainers in Johto that I consistently have to save in front of. In Kanto, there are a few really nasty trainers that can be particularly challenging to solo runs. I'm thinking of the Exploding Hiker, the Hypno Rocket, and the Hypno Psychic in Koga's Gym. Additionally also the Lass outside of Bill's house if you're running a water type. The rival in the underground isn't hard. His first three Pokemon are made up of two poison types and a steel type, so I use Surf on all of them. Next is Sneasel. I should have used Sludge Bomb here since it has lower defense than special defense. I should know this honestly because I'm planning a run with it very soon. After that, Feraligator is last. It survives the Sludge Bomb, and then it goes down to a second hit. Let's make our way to Claire. In her gym, I test out Sludge Bomb against a trainer that has a Dragonair. Looks good. Claire opens with three of these. I use Sludge Bomb, and they all go down to a single hit. 
Kingdra comes out last. It goes for a first turn smokescreen. Ah yes, the Generation 2 Sand Attack. I do know that this is in the game in Generation 1, but it's just far more common in Johto than it is in Kanto. I miss my next attack, and Kingdra uses Hyper Beam. Quillfish survives, and knocks it out. I'm moving on to the league. We've come so far, little sea urchin. All the way from losing to small pigeons, and now to defeating fierce dragons. Well done. While the footage from the final rival fight plays, let's discuss the league. Will could be extremely scary, because his Pokemon have Stab Psychic, which is super effective against us. Koga's Venomoth will also have Psychic, but it won't be Stab. After all, it's a Grass Flying type. Not sure what I was saying before about Fairy type, I, I honestly get mixed up on this Pokemon. It's, it's a Grass Flying type. I proved that in my last video, so if you're curious about that, go watch the intro. Bruno shouldn't be an issue. Karen, I can foresee some annoying Umbreon tactics with Sand Attack, maybe followed by Curse from Gengar or a Paralysis from Vileplume. Lance should be fine though, because I still have Rollout on my moveset, and Surf is super effective against Aerodactyl and Charizard. Here are my stats and moveset before the league. Do you think I can do it? Let's find out. Will opens with Zatu. I get started on my Rollout against it, and then Psychic does massive damage to Quillfish. I knock it out, and now that I'm rolling, I get through Jinx and Slowbro in a single hit each. Rollout continues on his next Zatu and knocks it out. Executor is last. E Executor? Eggs-Egutor? Eggs-Egutor? I think Eggs-Egutor, like two eggs. Egg-Egg. Eggs-Egutor? Anyways, let me know if I got that one. In this challenge, I won't be saving between league members. I'm looking for a consistent league run with Quillfish. If I can't do it at this level, I'll spend some more time training and then reattempt. Koga opens with Ariados. I get Rollout started because I'm gonna want to one-shot the Venomoth, which is next. I really don't want Psychic to hit me. I take the Ariados down without issue and land my hit against Venomoth. See? Rock moves are super effective against it. That's because it's a flying type. Fortress stops my Rollout with a Protect, and this gives me a chance to switch into Surf. It doesn't resist water moves, and its special defense isn't incredible. Mach is next, and I honestly don't have a good option for it. It resists Sludge Bomb and has good special defense. Additionally, it knows Minimize, which can really mess Rollout up. I think the best choice here is to just use Surf and take it down over 3 turns. Against Koga's Ace Crobat, I go for Rollout. I only need to hit 2 times consecutively. It usually likes to start off with a double team, so this isn't always possible, but in this fight, I get what I need, and Crobat faints. Bruno isn't challenging. Hitmontop is going to land at least one dig, since I can't KO it. After that, I should have switched into Sludge Bomb for the Hitmonchan. So it hangs on with a sliver and does damage to me with Thunder Punch. Hitmonlee is frail and falls to Sludge Bomb, and Onyx takes 4 times damage from Surf and faints. Machamp is last. I do good damage with Sludge Bomb, and it uses Rock Slide. Quillfish survives, and we're moving on to Karen. Are you ready for the pain? Umbreon lands a sand attack first turn before it faints. Then I miss against Vileplume due to sand attack. My next sludge bomb lands, but Vileplume survives because it only takes neutral damage. It paralyzes me. I switch into rollout because my sludge bomb PP is low, but in retrospect, I should have just used it again. This misplay allows Vileplume to heal. Sludge Bomb would have KO'd it. Because it's bought time, it's able to do damage with Petal Dance before it goes down. Then, Gengar gets a curse off, and Quillfish misses far too many times. The first attempt at the league ends in defeat at Karen. Adding Rust to my moveset is going to improve my reliability significantly and allow me to heal status conditions in the fight against Karen. Despite thinking of this in the moment, I don't actually do it. I was playing this portion of the game when I was really tired. I couldn't sleep and I decided to get some more work done. I end up failing against the league four more times because I make simple misplays. I forget to teach rest to Quillfish. I forget to use an ether when I should have. Uh, then I forget to heal before a fight. I train up two levels, clear my head and refocus. I really do think this is possible at my previous level and it certainly is starting at level 55. I'm ready to go now. We've been watching my 6th attempt. You can see that I've streamlined the Will, Koga, and Bruno fights. These are all consistent now. 
Karen is always where my attempt has ended. In this battle, Umbreon doesn't use sand attack. Thank you, Karen. That's really kind of you. I knock it out and Vileplume is next. It paralyzes me, and this time I use Sludge Bomb twice in a row. This knocks it out, despite its use of second turn Moonlight. I accidentally spam Sludge Bomb against Gengar. Uh, that really hurts. I need to slow down and really stop the A button spam. I'm sort of addicted to it. I really need to stop making these sorts of mistakes. I switch into Surf, but it's slightly too late. Gengar uses Spite twice and depletes all of Surf's PP. I'm forced to switch into Rollout. This will be strong if it powers up on Murkrow and then continues against Houndoom. Unfortunately, Paralysis stops Quillfish. I'm going to heal up now with Rest. This is why I added it to my moveset anyways. I'm not going to let this slip away now. I wake up and use Sludge Bomb instead. I think this will be more consistent and do more damage than Rollout anyways. I knock the Murkrow out. Houndoom, her ace, is last. A single Sludge Bomb gets the job done, and with that I've completed the Elite Four. It's time for the champion, Lance. I use some ethers in order to replenish my PP after the fight with Karen. Because I'm saving at the start of the league, and I'm resetting if I fail to complete the entire league in one attempt, I'll always have these ethers at this point. Due to my water typing, Quillfish can begin rollout on Gyarados. This sets it up to the point where I begin to sweep. Dragonite 1 goes down. Dragonite 2 goes down. Dragonite 3 comes out, and Quillfish lands its fifth consecutive rollout hit, knocking it out. The only two Pokemon left are Aerodactyl and Charizard, both of which I have a type advantage against with Surf. Lance was the easiest member of the league by far. Will, Koga's Venomoth, and Karen were all scary in their own way but the Dragon Master is no match for my small sea urchin. In Kanto, I'm going to try to beat as many of the first four gyms as I can without healing. These are usually really easy, and this is a way to make things a bit more engaging. I won't always have the PP I need for a particular leader, so I won't be able to just spam the moves that are best against them. Surge scares me in theory, but because of the level curve and the fact that Sludge Bomb is really really good, I make it through this fight without a problem. Next, I take on Sabrina. I like her sprite in this generation. Cute bangs, awesome purpley pink and black catsuit thing. Looking good. She's easy, uh, because psychic Pokemon don't resist poison types, that's what I meant. Making matters worse for her, all of her Pokemon have poor defense stats, and Sludge Bomb is a physical move. Erica's gym is annoying because I need to fight three trainers just to get to her. Because I'm not healing, these trainers take a lot of my PP. Luckily, against Erica, I have one Sludge Bomb left, which I use for the Monograss Tangela. I can switch into Rollout against Victory Bell, and then hope for a sweep. It takes three turns for Rollout to knock the Victory Bell out, but after that, I sweep with two easy KOs on her two remaining Pokemon. Janine is last. Rollout is incredible here. It only uses one PP to get the full five turn Rollout off. So this move alone has allowed me to conserve PP in a way that wasn't possible in the Dunsparce challenge. In addition, rock moves deal super effective damage to her Pokemon. So with that, I've done it. I've defeated these four Kanto leaders without healing. It's going to be a dark day when I can't accomplish this. So far, I'm two for two on attempts at this. I do the short rocket plotline and then challenge the remaining gym leaders of Kanto. They're all easy. Misty falls to Sludge Bomb, and I have a type advantage against both Brock and Blaine. These leaders are mostly just experience points and nostalgia at this point. But they are helping me get prepared for Blue and Red. Speaking of which, Blue is next. The Earth Badge Gym Leader opens with Pidgeot. I, I always find that really funny. Despite Rollout being super effective here, I don't want to initiate it. If you start rolling, you can't stop. And I need to be able to switch into Surf against Rhydon. So I knock the Pidgeot out with a combination of Sludge Bomb and a Surf. Alakazam is next, and it goes down to Sludge Bomb. Now it's time for Rhydon, and it takes 4 times damage from Surf, and that makes this fight a foregone conclusion. This is the easiest blue has been in any of my challenges to date. Gyarados is the same as it was against the champion. It's an opportunity to get Rollout going. Two turns later it's finished, and Egg Egg Egg- Oh gosh, this one is getting me now. Eggs Eggutor. Eggs Eggutor. I think I got it. Eggs Egg. Egg Egg. Eggs Eggutor. Okay. Here's where things get scary. My third rollout doesn't knock it out, 
allowing for it to set up Sunny Day for Arcanine. Then my fifth and final rollout misses Arcanine, and it starts to use Flamethrower. This is getting a 50% boost from Sunny Day, so it's doing a lot of damage to us. I'm gonna use Rest. I need to buy time until the sun has faded, because in addition to powering up fire moves, sun halves the power of water type moves. While I'm sleeping, the sunlight fades, and when Quillfish wakes up, the restored power of Surf knocks the Arcanine out. So we're actually making pretty good time to this point in the game. I'm pretty impressed with this little sea urchin. He's doing such a great job. There is only one fight left now. Red. He leads with Pikachu. It immediately outspeeds and uses Thunder. Quillfish, no. All right, so what if Thunder misses? My second fight allows me to explore this possibility. Pikachu misses because Thunder only has 70% accuracy. And then I land Sludge Bomb and it knocks the Pikachu out. Okay, that's good. It looks like it's gonna consistently knock that out. Espeon is next. It outspeeds as well and uses Psychic and knocks Quillfish out. Well, that's a rough and unpromising start to the red fight. I scour the game for rare candies and then train Quillfish up to level 70 on wild Pokemon. At this level, I return to red and use all 10 rare candies that I've collected. I save before using them in case it isn't possible at this level. In that case, I'll train up and then use rare candies starting at a higher level. I really don't want to have to grind from level 90 to level 100. Pikachu comes out and I cross my fingers. But surprisingly, Quillfish outspeeds and knocks it out. This is consistent now. Espeon is next. And again, little Puff the Quillfish impresses me as he outspeeds and knocks it out with Sludge Bomb. Well done, little guy. But the big guy is next. Snorlax has got to be where this hype train ends. I use Sludge Bomb, and it does more than half damage. Snorlax uses Amnesia, and then faints to another Sludge Bomb. The hype train continues. Can Quillfish actually do this? Venusaur comes out. I outspeed, but it doesn't go down to a single hit. This allows it to set up Sunny Day. That's going to make Charizard more powerful. But then, in a strange turn of events, he sends out Blastoise. This is likely because Quillfish is a water type and Charizard is weak to water. Blastoise uses Blizzard, as its power isn't cut during the sun, and I knock it out in two turns with Sludge Bomb. Charizard is last. Is this really going to be a sweep with a level 80 Quillfish using exclusively Sludge Bomb? I outspeed even the Charizard, and it goes down to orange health. Then it lands Flamethrower during the sunshine, dealing so much damage. Quillfish just barely survives with 4 hit points. We did it. At level 80, I am so surprised by this. That gives Quillfish a completion time of 3 hours, 18 minutes, and 28 seconds. I never would have guessed that this little smug pufferfish would be the fastest and easiest Pokemon that I've used so far in a Johto game. Its time gives it a 1 hour and 40 minute lead over Heracross. I do think though if I tried again I'd be able to get a faster time with all of my previous Pokemon. The amount that I've learned over the past 2 months is staggering. I'm figuring out faster routes through the game and better ordering of events like in Ecritique City. I'm also getting more consistent. And after this video's trauma, when my Pokemon mom bought me a doll with my money, I'm definitely going to wean myself off the A button spam. The type chart is also slowly being burnt into my mind. As one of my teachers once said, when I needed to remember important material, Scott, tattoo this onto your body. I better book an appointment and tattoo Venomoth's typing onto my arm, so I don't forget that it's grass flying. Next weekend, I'm going to be doing another Johto challenge, and it's going to be with Stantler. It's another forgotten Pokemon, and I'm really excited to try it out for the first time. I'll be releasing my Fossils versus race at some point also in the near future. I am working on it, but it's taking a lot of time because of its scope. It's a 16,000 word script, and I think that everyone is going to be impressed with how thorough it's going to be. If we're deciding between Lord Helix and the Dark Lord Dome, we do need rigorous testing. Thanks so much for watching. If you enjoy my content, like, subscribe, comment, grab a dome fossil, and share this video with a friend. Another way to directly support me is through my Patreon. You'll become a part of this awesome credit sequence. Link is in the description. But the most important thing is that you're here watching. Thanks so much. You're incredible. I'll see you in my next video.